Welcome to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm Stephen Browdy, Professor and Chair of Philosophy here at UMBC. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, John Rennie Short, Professor of Public Policy at UMBC. Welcome, John. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. John, you have unusually broad interests and areas of expertise. You're an authority on urban issues, environmental concerns, globalization, political geography, and also the history of cartography. Anything else that I should mention? No, I think that covers most of my interests, I think. Well, tell us something about your background. Uh, yes, uh, you can tell by my accent. I was, wasn't born in the United States. I was born in central Scotland. Um, I went to the University of Aberdeen to initially study Scottish literature, but changed to geography. Uh, graduated uh, and then went to uh, graduate school at the University of Bristol. Uh, did postdoctoral research and then uh, was employed as what you would call an assistant uh, professor at the University of Reading. And then in 1990, I came, I was appointed as a uh, full professor at Syracuse University uh, in upstate New York. And I came to UMBC, as we, as we call it, uh, in 2002. Now, by my count, you've written or mm -hmm. co-authored 33 books. Is that about right? That's right. It's, uh, I was reminded of uh, a comment by John Kenneth Galbraith, the great economist. He said when he was under 40, he found it very difficult to write. But when he was over 40, he found it difficult to stop. <laughs> and clearly both over 40 and finding it difficult to stop. Well, I was thinking maybe you need to ramp up your productivity you think, a little yeah, bit. I think, yeah. You don't want to be a slacker. Um, your two most mm -hmm. recent books are Cartographic Encounters, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press, and also Cities and Nature, published by Routledge. Um, let's talk about those for a few minutes. Can we start with cities and nature? Yes, yes. It looks like these are two quite distinct themes. Uh, how do they relate? Uh, it's interesting that they're normally considered separate, and that's been one of the divisions in the uh, discussions and the popular understanding, indeed, in the social science literature. On the one hand, we have nature, wilderness, preservation uh, of the so-called natural environment. And the urban is seen as somehow profane, not natural environment. Um, and what we've tried to do in this book is to bring together a large number of studies, including Iran, that bring together this ecological perspective, but focused in on the city. The city is the major environment for the majority of the world's population. People, most people live in cities. And you see intimate mm -hmm. relationships between the cities and the environment, ecological relationships? Yes, very much. Uh, it's a standard thing, for example, uh, central cities are at least two to five degrees warmer than suburban areas. There's something called the urban heat island. Cities actually impact uh, uh, local climates. They affect and influence uh, um, uh, local climates. They also uh, change the habitat. Uh, it's not simply a case that uh, urban areas demolish um, all ecosystems. Sometimes certain species, for example, do quite well. Uh, hawks do quite well in central Manhattan, for example, strangely enough. So you want to interpret mm -hmm. cities as part of the larger environment. You don't want to separate the cities off. From exactly. The uh, we want to see that both in one hand, we want to see the cities as part of the ecological processes, the, the biogeochemical cycles, and part of the, 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 our understanding of the environment. And the same way, we also want to look at the environment as also a social phenomenon. I'll give you one example. Often we use the term natural disasters, often when they apply to cities. For example, um, Katrina in New Orleans. Well, in closer inspection, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. Uh, disasters affect some societies more than others, some cities more than others, and some people in cities more than others. Uh, physical elements are mediated through social differences, uh, political systems. Uh, there's really no such thing as a natural disaster. Uh, there are really much more environmental um, impacts in specific places. So there must be political mm -hmm. ramifications about this book. Yes, very much in the sense of we can only understand the urban and the environment through an understanding of political and economic arrangements. Well, how would our attitudes mm -hmm. or policies toward mm -hmm. pollution, for example, be affected <clears throat> by the perspective you're taking in this book? For example, one of the biggest pollutions uh, we have in the United States is the large amount of uh, garbage and waste. We have a huge waste stream, uh, as it's referred to. Uh, 
that's obviously connected to the forms of consumption, the packaging, uh, the excessive packaging often. Uh, compare this with many other parts of the world. So pollution levels are not separate from um, economic systems or, or um, individual consumption patterns. There's a connection between society and the environment, uh, between social issues and environmental issues. And that's one of the main themes of the book. So what would you like to mm. see, what kind of effect would you like to mm. see this book have on public policy? The sense that the city is part of the environment, that environmental issues, environmental policies need an urban component. And similarly, urban policies need to be much more aware of environmental issues. In the past, we had environmental policies which generally were connected with preserving wilderness, for example, is a dominant theme in the United States. Or urban policies concerned with generating more economic growth. But if we look at these in a different light, we can see that actually it's impossible to have uh, sustainable urban economies without a much greater awareness of environmental issues. Let's mm. talk for a few minutes about uh, your other new book, Cartographic Encounters. Mm. What does that title mean? Cartographic Encounters, uh, it's not a, uh, someone else has used the, the, the phrase before, in fact many people. It really refers to the collaboration uh, between um, explorers and indigenous people. Uh, in other words, map making, for example, done by uh, early, early explorers into, the, into North America and subsequently the United States, they weren't doing it on their own. There was an encounter with indigenous people which was central to the maps that were made and the geographical understandings that were produced. And how did you find mm -hmm. that out? I assume that the indigenous people didn't have written records of these encounters, so you must have gotten this information somewhere. Well, strangely enough, I went back to the original sources. You're, you're correct. We don't have a good record of uh, indigenous people. Often they're, they're uh, non-literate societies, they're oral culture, and we've lost m many of their stories. But the explorers, for example, uh, John Smith, uh, the early English explorer in Virginia, or Charles Fremont, uh, exploring in the, uh, uh, the western areas of the United States in the 19th century, often would keep very meticulous diaries and records. Over the, the years, people have ignored these, and they tend to then do the very quick summary of you know, exploration with the great men theory. Uh, but if you actually go back and really read their journals, they're very revealing about uh, their use of uh, native informants, as they called them, on their use of maps made by indigenous people. Often these maps would be made on the ground, um, on, in the snow, uh, on birch, uh, and we now have a very good record of these. So if you go back to the journals and really read the journals in their entirety, I can see why people don't do that. They tend to read the, uh, uh, the cliff note versions. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go back to the originals, you see how totally reliant they were on indigenous informants. I did this for both the United States uh, and indeed for Australia. There's one chapter in the book in Australia. And it's a similar pattern. I could have done the same with the English in Africa or in India. There's this recurring pattern of when people arrive in a country, these weren't blank spaces. They were populated, inhabited by people. And these people had incredible geographical knowledge and often a very sophisticated map making ability. And these were used by uh, newcomers, uh, the, the new migrants, the new explorers, the new invaders, if you want. I'm a little surprised mm -hmm. to learn that mm -hmm. this must be a novel mm -hmm. position to be taking. I'm surprised that scholars in your area haven't made something of this in the past? I think because the history of exploration has really been written from just one side. It's really been a, a celebratory uh, achievement of certain explorers. More recently there's been a uh, criticism of them. So that now we've looked at their psychology, their, their uh, sexual orientation in order to kind of like identify them as having feet of clay. I'm not concerned with that. I'm actually concerned with the collaboration that was involved. It was a kind of joint enterprise. Now something was gained and something was lost. The Native Americans would often give information for a reason. They wanted the trade goods. They wanted the military power associated with the Europeans coming, for example. Uh, and they gave up their geographical knowledge in return for trade goods, um, political alliances. But ultimately, they lost. I refer to it as a, as, a, uh, as a collusion that ended in tragedy because by giving up geographical information, they essentially gave away their power. Um, so they lost something from this encounter, this collaboration.
So you're making mm -hmm. conjectures about a side of the story that we can only infer from the one side that was actually written True, down. it's very kind of biased. But my argument is, if I'm only getting the story from one side, the side that wasn't the indigenous people, and if they mention indigenous people, think how you would get the story if you really did get the indigenous side. In other words, I'm going to the least sympathetic account of the indigenous people and still discovering uh, a huge amount of, of indigenous uh, involvement. And being indigenous, I mean by local people. Right. Uh, and we know some of that. For example, the Lewis and Clark, it's well known that they relied on various informants. Uh, but almost every Western exploration uh, was almost, in some cases, almost totally reliant. Uh, I tell the story of Charles Fremont, who couldn't leave a US Army fort without hiring first a guide, uh, a native guide. Uh, a man called Tai Kai Bull. Every you know, exploration that left certain parts of the, the United States needed this guide, wanted this guide. And you can read in their accounts about how they would, um, uh, they would want this guide and how they'd be unhappy if they were palmed off with a secondary guide and how much they would pay. It's totally revealing. What struck me was almost a sort of surprise that no one had looked at these sources before in quite this way. I really was almost shocked by that. Uh, pleasantly shocked because it meant it was a new area for me right. to write about. So much else has passed down in the indigenous cultures from one generation to the next. I'm surprised that more information isn't apparently passed down about these encounters with the... We have, we have a record in a way. Often the, the cartographic encounters took place in and through maps. So you can actually follow the patterns of indigenous map makers through subsequent more European, more, more US maps. In other words, there's a, there's a sort of underground cartographic architecture uh, that once, you're, once you know what you're looking for, you can identify very clearly the, the, the reliance on river systems. So if you look at French maps of the 18th century of the, the um, interior of what is now the United States, is dominated by river systems. Oh, why is that? Well, the reason is because the Native Americans moved around through the rivers. They had a very sophisticated knowledge of how the river uh, basin uh, kind of connected. And so French maps, directly um, uh, following on from their work, have this incredibly intricate uh, hydrological mapping, which they wouldn't know of themselves. So why do we have this sophisticated hydrology? It's really because of that. So that was the main interstate for the Native Americans. They knew about it, and that's what they did in their, their maps, which the French copied down um, and annotated. And sometimes, some French maps would often say, um, written with the aid of a certain informant. We, we, we actually have that in a number of maps, which I mentioned. Famous one is of a giant, ma a big map of the whole Western Territory. It was done uh, by a, a member of the Blackfoot tribe, uh, whose um, work was written down by a man called Peter Fiddler. And he actually wrote down the map that this um, informant actually did in the snow, probably. And so we now have, we have a record of these things. So in other words, the maps, even contemporary maps, have this underground architecture of, of Native Americans, just in the same way as we have a linguistic um, backdrop, in the sense of Manhattan is named after you know, uh, uh, Native peoples, and the whole you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts. The same way we have this linguistic layer, we also have a cartographic layer that once you're aware of, you can see, and that's what I tend to do in the book, try to uncover this contribution, which we now have forgotten about. Now, this book only deals with certain parts of the world. Does that mean there'll be a place for a second edition or a second version of Could uh, be, yeah. I, I, it's mainly dealing with North America, because I deal with Canada and, and and then the United States. And there's one chapter in Australia, just to show that it's not a distinctly uh, North American thing. But uh, there's clearly room for a whole body of work to be done. And perhaps uh, once I finish a couple of projects, I may come back to that again. I just find it fascinating because I love looking at the and reading the journals. They're very revealing. People tell you about their deepest fears. Uh, they're often, uh, they can be poetic at times about the physical landscape, about the people, the indigenous people. Um, and they're also very revealing about the the, the drama that goes on with these explorations and mapping expeditions. So they're enormously uh, rewarding to read them. They, they still speak to us today. I'm sure it's a very interesting book. Do you have a website where you can get information about 
this book and uh, all your others. Yes, I do. I, my the website is easy to remember. It's johnrenneshort.com. And I also have a blog, which is johnrenneshort.blogspot.com. Well, John, we've enjoyed speaking with you today. We've been visiting with John Rennie Short, Professor of Public Policy at UMBC. John, thanks for joining us today at UMBC. Thank you very much, David.